All right, we're in John chapter 12 this morning, and we've read the text already. Jumping right in here, we remember that Jesus here is being approached by a few uh, Greeks or non-Jews that are wanting to find out more about him, and then he launches into this discussion that really seems to be rather grim. Uh, he starts with verse 23 saying, the hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Now, you and I know what that means. Uh, we know that Jesus is approaching his imminent death. He's going to be crucified on a cross. If you've seen the movie or you've read the book, you know that this is a pretty gruesome thing. If you know anything about crucifixion, this is quite the execution. It was particularly designed to inflict maximum pain upon the individual being crucified. And so when Jesus says what he says in verse 23, we, we get it. We know what's coming. Here's what's interesting about the way he phrases it in verse 23. He says, the hour has come, that means it's about time, and we know that he's only days away at this point, that the Son of Man should be glorified. And it's interesting to me that he says glorified and not crucified, because if I was in his shoes, I'd be thinking about the crucifixion. But he doesn't say that. He doesn't say, oh, the hour has come that the Son of Man is going to be crucified. He doesn't say, you know, a couple days from now I'm going to get executed. He's not thinking about the execution. He's not thinking about the crucifixion. His mind is focused on the glory that would come after. This is a significant detail that you and I need to understand about Jesus. He was never distracted by a fear of how bad obedience to God might hurt him. He was never distracted by that fear which so often distracts you and I. Oh, if I obey God, what, what's this going to do to me? How bad is this going to hurt if I do what God's telling me to do? Jesus never saw it that way. He looked at the glory that was beyond the obedience. Compelled by what obedience to God would produce. That should excite us like it excited Jesus. We're so, aren't we grim sometimes, you know? Like, oh, God's asking me, I know what he wants me to do. Oh. But have you ever asked yourself why he wants you to do it? You know that there's always good on the other side of the obedience God is calling you to, no matter how hard that obedience is. And do you know that your sinful nature is always going to see obedience to God as dreadful? If anything in you is excited about obeying God, chalk that up as the Holy Spirit. Your flesh doesn't want to. Your flesh doesn't see anything but crucifixion ahead, execution, death to self, pain, suffering, torture. I don't want to do this Christian thing. But the spirit inside of you that's willing is bursting with excitement going, do it, do it. Jesus, controlled by the Holy Spirit, is compelled to obey because he knows that there's great glory on the other side of it. And we see that here in verse 23. He's not focused on the crucifixion that's coming up. He's focused on the glory that lies just ahead. For a lot of us, we may have a desire for God's glory. If we're Christians, we do. If you have the Holy Spirit in you, you do. There's something in you that desires to live a life for the glory of God. But so often that desire for God's glory gets lost behind a concern over the suffering we have to endure in order for that glory to come about. Isn't that true? Christian, you want to live for the glory of God, right? But what stops us so often is knowing what it's going to take in order for that to happen. And that's why Jesus says what he says in verses 24 and 25. See, he's not done in verse 23. He's not like, oh, coming up pretty quick, I'm going to get executed. But there's glory past that, okay? Just wanted you to know. No, he's got more to say. And he addresses this to you and I. Like I get that these words were spoken 2,000 years ago, but they still ring true today. For anybody who wants to follow Christ and glorify God with their life, but is a little bit afraid to do so. Now here's what's interesting is Jesus, knowing that it's hard for us to, to live a life that is fully committed to obedience, knowing, knowing that it's difficult for us, he doesn't, he doesn't console you and say, come up here, sit on my lap, and, you know, I'll, it'll be okay. Let me just give you a warm cup of milk and rock you to sleep, and by the time you wake up after a good nap, you'll forget how scary it was, you know. Rather, he pushes in even further and goes, let me tell you something. 
it works this way with wheat where unless it dies, it does very little. But what's true in nature is true of you. If wheat doesn't go into the ground and die, it remains alone. You want your life to count for something? Do you want your life to count for something? Then you're going to have to get over the fear of obedience and what it might bring into your life and push through and obey God no matter what the cost. You're like, but it could kill me. Precisely. That's why he says what he does in verse 24. It's a... At least he's not trying to pull the wool over your eyes and going, well, Christianity's going to make all your dreams come true. Don't worry, you'll never die. You'll never suffer. You'll never have hard times. No, he goes, obedience is scary. That's why he says in verse 27, my soul's troubled. I'm freaked out by obedience. Isn't that crazy? That Jesus, in obeying God, was troubled? I mean, you should be going, oh, that's actually good to hear because <laughs> I'm not alone. Plus, I'm in really good company. If Jesus was troubled by what obedience to God would bring for him, and I'm troubled by what obedience to God might bring for me, well, at least it's kind of justified. I mean, if, if it's good for Jesus, then it, I'm not in trouble. Yeah, you're not in trouble. It's okay to be afraid to obey God. Trouble comes when you let that fear control you and you don't anymore. That's when you're in trouble. You understand that? So you have two choices. You can either incur for yourself great trouble by obeying God or... You can incur great trouble yourself, by yourself by refusing to. The only difference is where the trouble and the pain is going to come from. It's either going to come from the world because you're obeying the God they hate or it's going to come from God himself because he's a father that disciplines any disobedient children. You just get to pick which source the pain comes from. There's a lot of Christians, and you may be one of them, who want to live for Jesus. And there's something in them that wants to live a life of significance. I think it's easier to find somebody who wants to live a significant life than it is to find somebody who really doesn't give a rip, doesn't care if their life amounts to anything, doesn't care if they do anything profound, doesn't care if they make a dent, doesn't care if they do. A lot of Christians want that. I know I do. I want my life to count. I don't want to spin my wheels for 60, 70, 80 years and then die and God goes, well, he made it. <laughs> I want him, when I die, to look at me and go, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into eternal, you've worked plenty hard. You need a rest. Come on in. I built something for you. It's, it's got a really, it's got a, crazy awesome easy chair and it has your name on it you'll see it in there that's what I want but a lot of Christians I think would agree with me on this we want to live a life for Jesus and we want to live a life of significance but in the end if you will have there aren't going to be many who do so the desire is there but the reality is if you will and it's not because we haven't been told how. We know how to live a life of significance. If you've been in this church long enough, you know how to live a life of significance. And it's not because we don't have the opportunity to do it. You are surrounded with God-given opportunity to live a life that is made significant because you've decided to obey him throughout your day and throughout your week and throughout your life rather than dismissing yourself from the obedience that so concerns you. You have the opportunity. You have the desire. You have the knowledge. Problem is, you're also afraid. Hey, and I'm not picking on you either. Your pastor is afraid to obey God. And I can say that because of verse 27. <laughs> Jesus was troubled too. Yet your pastor's troubled. I bet you are. I'll bet you that there are times where you know what God wants you to do, but you don't do it because you're afraid of what people will think. You're afraid of getting attacked, being made fun of, losing friends on Facebook. You're controlled by fear. And Jesus here is reminding us that what's true of wheat was true for Jesus. 
And what's true for Jesus is true for me and you. If we're too afraid to obey God because of what it might do to us, our life is going to prove worthless. No matter what else you may accomplish, doesn't matter. You may have the best of educations. You may climb the ladder to the top of your field. You may be oh so successful in the eyes of the world and die and have nothing to show for it in God's economy. And I've met some of the people who in this world would be considered most brave because of the, the choices they've made in life and the directions they've taken and the careers that they have gotten, military. They, I have met people who in the world's eyes are extremely brave. They've been on the front lines of warfare. And yet when it comes to the things of the kingdom of God, they're cowards. I believe that in God's world, Christians require a level of bravery that exceeds anything that the world would require of somebody. That's why so, pe so few people are going to give up everything to follow Christ. It's easier to do it the world's way. Eh, scary here and there. Try being a disciple of Jesus Christ. If it scares Jesus in verse 27, I guarantee you it will scare you. Well, what Jesus says in these short couple of verses about wheat, dying, and by dying, accomplishing much, crushes the false idea that letting God direct your life is a waste. It obliterates that false idea that is so widely circulated in our modern culture that says becoming the master of your own destiny is really the way to live. That's the way to live a life of significance. No, what Jesus says here is well, that's actually the way to die. That's the way to lose your life trying to control your own fate, become the master of your own des destiny, trying to decide how things are going to look, keeping things under your own control because you're too afraid to relinquish control to Jesus Christ's dictates. That's the way to actually lose your life. He turns the whole idea upside down and inside out. You can either obey God and die or disobey God and die. Because... <laughs> like, Unless I remind us that in the end, everybody dies, we're going to look at verse 24 and 25 and go, whoa, that's heavy. Like, I got to give up my life in order to, like, Jesus is talking about death. That freaks You're going to die no matter what. You're going to die of a car accident. You're going to die of a heart attack. You're going to just get old and wither away. But nobody, 10 out of 10 people die. So how do you want to do it? Do you want to go out in glory? Do you want to go out for God's honor? Do you want to go out fighting? Or do you want to wither away and peter out? And then face God in judgment. Consider something here. Those of you who want your life to count for something. Okay, I'm, I'm only talking to you now. <laughs> and I'll bet you I'm talking to everybody. If you want your life to count for something, then consider this, please. The world will produce <clears throat> 777 million metric tons of wheat in 2019 alone. 777 million metric tons of wheat this year, which is, by the way, the most important grain in the world and provides more nourishment for human beings than any other food source. Consider this. The number of kernels harvested this year is whatever 37 million times 777 million is. <laughs> so we know how many kernels of wheat are going to be grown this year in the whole world. And every single one of those kernels can be traced all the way back to the third day of creation when God said, let there be wheat. 
the only reason that you were able to enjoy your waffles this morning or your pancakes or your toast or whatever it was that you ate, pumpkin muffins, was because some of that wheat on day three was willing to die. You have that wheat to thank for your muffin. <laughs> and the same principle is being applied to you and me. Do you want your life to be significant? Do you want your life to go beyond your own generation? Do you want the impact of your life to be felt long, long, long after you're dead? Because it's not going to happen by accident. There has to be an intentionality to the way that you're living and the way that you're seeking the Lord's instruction and then the way that you're obeying the instruction that he gives if you want that to happen. And if you don't live an intentional life, you're going to die and have no effect on the world around you or the generations to come. The impact that your life will have made will be so small and so insignificant that it's probable no one beyond your immediate sphere will ever know that you even lived. Strangers will walk through the graveyard and look at your name and not know who it was. Jesus did not live his life that way. And Paul did not live his life that way. And Moses and David and Abraham and everybody that we know of thousands of years later didn't live their life that way. And you think of all that Jesus Christ achieved because he decided to obey God to death even when he was freaked out. We know what he achieved in part because he tells us in verse 31 and 32, he says, the world is judged. He says the ruler of the world will be cast out. He defeats the devil. He breaks the power of sin. He secures salvation for you and I and everybody else. <laughs> I mean, if Jesus wouldn't have pushed through the fear, the trouble, none of this would have ever happened. We'd have no salvation available. The devil would be in full control. Your sin would dominate you for eternity. There's a lot of people who would receive Jesus for the salvation that he offers and then refuse to yield their life to him. Do you know how tragic that is? Your funeral will be the worst. Jesus says in verse 26, backing up just some, he says, if anyone serves me. And we talk a lot about service to Jesus around here. You know, we serve Christ. Uh, we come together on a Sunday and everybody's got their spot and we worship and we eat and we clean up the church and we go home. And some of us go from here to other areas of ministry to serve Jesus. And we all take part in that because... We believe that by vacuuming the floor, that's serving the Lord. And we believe that by baking in the kitchen, that's serving the Lord. And we believe that by playing music, we're serving the Lord. And we believe that by recording this message to put online is an act of service to the Lord. And here's what Jesus has to say about service. If you're serving me, you'll follow me. And you'll know that you're following me because you'll be wherever I am. Wherever I am. Well, where is he going? Where is Jesus? Especially at the time that he said that. I'll tell you where he is. He's on his way to the gas chamber, right? He's on his way to the electric chair. He's on his way to the cross. <laughs> and then I'll tell you this. If you ever want to know where Jesus is, at any given moment of your life, he's not hard to find if you know where to look. Jesus isn't hiding. You want to know where to look? You, know, you want to know where to find Jesus? He's on the path of obedience. 
He'll always be found on the path of obedience. Always. And if you've lost sight of him at this point in your life, you can be sure that if you look back to the path of obedience, you'll see him there. Run to him. He says if you're serving him, that's where you'll be. If you're serving him, if not, you won't. And something beautiful is revealed at the end of that verse where he says, if anyone serves me, him, my father, will honor. Him, my father, will honor. The servant. We're told here that God himself will honor those who serve him. We'll be, we'll be honored for serving him, not for being his child. Like, I'm a child of God. I'm a Christian. Yeah, you, well, there's no guarantee. He never said he'd honor that. He's going to honor those who serve him, who follow Christ beyond the fear that obedience incurs and they will push and follow Jesus into those most frightening of places. If anyone serves me, him, my father will honor. <clears throat> you guys are all familiar with like the Grammys and the Emmys and the whatever else, you know. You get a trophy for being a good actor or a good singer, all those kinds of things. And every once in a while, it'll happen on a year where somebody within that field of entertainment died, like Prince, you know, or, or, or and then they do this Lifetime Achievement Award for the dead guy. And it's a great thing of honor because they were so brilliant in that field and wouldn't it be cool if they did that for a guy while he was still alive, there to enjoy it, you know? Now, here's what's interesting. You can get together the entire academy, the, 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 your peers, and be honored by them. That's one thing. For an actor to be honored by other actors or a musician to be honored by other musicians. Ima take that a step further and imagine what it will be like when God takes the time in however it's going to look to give you the Lifetime Achievement Award for all that you accomplished by serving him. Put whatever goes on at the Academy Awards to shame. I'd rather be honored by God in front of humanity than to be honored by a few currently popular actors in front of an academy and it says it's going to happen. God will honor those who are brave enough to serve Jesus and follow him wherever it is that he takes them. So in verse 27, now we catch up to the part where Jesus admits, <laughs> admits, uh, this could have made him sound weak. I'm freaked out, guys. Oh, well, we thought you were like totally cool about everything and like, you know, put together and nothing ever bothered you. Jesus is bothered. Remember that though he was God, he was also 100% man, subject to the same passions and desires. He was tempted in the same way that we are. Any way in which you've ever been tempted, he was likewise tempted. Jesus was a human being and he had to deal with his humanness from time to time. And here now, it's troubling him. Jesus did the will of God always. And if we think that it was easier for Jesus than it is for us just because he was God, I think we're wrong. If anything, I would say that Jesus being God would have made it harder for him to live the life that he did. Because think of this. For one, being God, there was way more responsibility placed on his shoulders than there will ever be placed upon your shoulders. His performance would affect the entire world. And I don't mean just the current world at that time. His performance would affect every dead generation and every yet unborn generation from time past all the way to the end of the human race. The entire timeline. You have the responsibility of maybe your coworkers on your shoulders. The way you live your life, whether it be in obedience to God or disobedience to God, will affect and influence the people in your small sphere. Jesus had a limitless 
sphere. Far greater responsibility for him. Thus, I believe it was harder for him than it will ever be for you to obey God fully. Secondly, being God, <laughs> Jesus faced far more opposition than you or I ever will. I mean, he caught heat for this. Jesus was ruthlessly attacked by the spirit world. Satan himself, you remember that part? Satan comes and attacks Jesus personally. If you ever get a personal visit from Satan, I don't know who you are, but you must be something. <laughs> usually, usually, if I'm lucky, and that's a weird way to put it, but um, if I'm lucky, I get a demonic sort of bother. And even then, I'm not sure. Maybe it's just me. Stuff's going rough, and I'm not sure what's going on, and things seem particularly difficult, and I go, well, maybe there's just I'm being harassed. I don't know. But I, you know, I've never had a visit from the devil. At least I don't think I have. I hope to God I haven't, and I hope I never do. Jesus did. And beyond the spirit world, he had human beings to deal with from all walks of life. I mean, he had the Jewish authorities all the way down to peasants and criminals. He had world leaders in the, in the Roman Empire coming after him to crucify him. You and I will never have that. At least I don't think so. Furthermore, this may trip you out a little bit, but Jesus had God himself to deal with. And when he went to the cross, God himself turned against Jesus and poured out his wrath on him as if he was the worst of all criminals. If you're a born-again believer, God will never do that to you. He will never turn against you like he did to his own son. Third, another reason why I think it was probably harder for Jesus since he was God than it will be for you and I to obey the Lord. Unlike you and I, Jesus could have gotten himself out of any situation he didn't like. He could have snapped his fingers at any moment and gotten himself out of any situation and yet decided not to. So imagine that. Imagine having to live your life in obedience to God knowing that with the snap of a finger you could get yourself off the hook but having to, like Jesus, constantly restrain yourself from the temptation of using that power and ability for self-serving purposes. See, I'm thankful I don't have that ability because sometimes I get into the will of God and I've got no choice but to keep pushing through because God doesn't give me an out. Kind of like moving to Duluth and becoming a pastor. I can't just walk away now. Sometimes I wish I could. See ya. <laughs> right? I'm out of here. I don't want this anymore. But I don't get to. Thank God that he sometimes locks me into the path that he's got me on. Puts up barricades. You know what I mean? Good grief. Imagine if all that went away. We'd be gone. Sometimes when you feel locked in, you feel a little claustrophobic about being part of the church and you're, you know, you're, you're like, like, I don't know where to go. I can't run. That's good. That's good. It'll hopefully keep you where you're supposed to be according to God's will when if it was up to you, you'd split. Jesus had it harder than any one of us. And a praying, look, look at this. He says, my soul is troubled. And what should I say? What am I supposed to do about it? You think I should pray? Oh, Father, save me from this hour. So apparently it had crossed Jesus' mind once or twice that he could pray himself out of trouble. He's saying this facetiously, but the thought had crossed his mind. He just refused to do it. He didn't dare pray himself out of trouble. So let me say this, guys. When you're faced with a particular step of required obedience that you don't particularly like, don't talk yourself out of it. Don't talk yourself out of it, which you could so easily do. And please, don't beg God to excuse you from it. Remember, it's what he called you to do. Don't look for a way out. See, because there's an all-too-common scenario in the Christian's life where they set out to do the will of God and they put their hand to the plow, so to speak, and they go along for a while, and then they're doing okay, but then suddenly it starts to get scary. It becomes a little more demanding than they had anticipated. And so a lot of people stop right there. It's too scary to go any further, and they won't. They're too afraid to go all in and die for Jesus. And their life 
ceases to be of value. God cannot use a grain of wheat that refuses to die. He cannot use, for productive reasons, a Christian that refuses to obey. It's impossible. A life of disobedience won't just by default accidentally produce wonderful things for the kingdom of God that will last for generations. It won't happen. And so if that's you and you go far enough in until you get scared and then stop right there, future generations will not benefit from the life that you lived. Your coworkers, your family, the people around you in this community benefit nothing. Now imagine, imagine a world without wheat. Imagine a world without wheat. No pumpkin muffins, no waffles, no toast, no pancakes, no pizza crust. Oh, I mean, what do you just make it, put it on a rice cake? <laughs> the repercussions of a world without wheat had those grains refused to die on day three would have been miserable by comparison, but I guess we never would have known, would we? If wheat never existed and we never tasted it and we never enjoyed pancakes, we never would miss pancakes. And I wonder how much in 2019 are we missing out on because people who lived in 1919 were too afraid to obey God. How much are we missing? You ever wonder that? What benefits are we not reaping because the generation prior to ours was too afraid to obey God? And now flip that around and go, what, what are those in 2119 going to have to live without the blessings and benefits that they'll never enjoy because you and I were too afraid to obey God? Jesus says, Father, glorify your name. I think this is the third time now where God's voice comes from heaven in response to Jesus. And God's voice comes and says, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. So apparently, this isn't a one-time only thing. God's been glorifying his name through Jesus' performance all along the way. You look back over any life that culminates in glory, if you look back over any life that culminates in glory, you'll see that it was marked by glory all along the way. God's fingerprints will have been all over that life. Same is true of a life that culminates in judgment. You look back over that life and you'll see too that there was evidence all along the way. Even if there was religion in that life, you'll look back, but you'll see that there was hypocrisy also, and there was selfishness, and there was pride. There will be the fingerprints of disobedience and godlessness all over that life that culminated in judgment. You'll look back and you'll see that it was marked by animosity and competition and conflict and division. You look back over that life and you'll see that there was a lack of transparency and there was a lack of peace and there was a lack of God's blessing. You'll see that it was a life that never made any difference. So however a person's life ends will make total sense when you remember what it looked like while they lived. And there ain't a religion in the world that can cover up a life like that. Not forever. Not even Christianity can cover up a grain of wheat that's unwilling to die. Jesus says, Father, glorify your name. And God comes and says, I am and have. They both want the same thing. You notice how Jesus and God both want the same thing even though it's going to cost both of them dearly. They both want this, even though it's going to cost them both. Listen, Christ's crucifixion was no less comfortable for God the Father than it was for Jesus the Son. And oftentimes when we look at the crucifixion, we go, how painful and terrible for Jesus. Mm-hmm, yes, and how painful and terrible for God the Father to reject the Son that he loved 
Only now can I really understand this, that I have a son of my own. I cannot imagine what God was going through in having to do that to his own kid, to punish him so violently in spite of his perfect obedience and ongoing loyalty and the never-ending affection that that boy had for his dad. What a heart-wrenching reality that God the Father had to go through that for you and I. Not to mention what Jesus Christ the Son had to go through for you and I. This costs both of them dearly, yet they both wanted it. They both wanted the same thing. Glory at all costs. Glory at all cost. Don't care how much it hurts. Neither of them cared. Neither of them minded how much they had to pay, how much they had to sacrifice, and what they had to endure. Glory. We want glory. Father, glorify your name. I am, son. I have been, and I'm gonna. Jesus didn't need to be pushed to live for God's glory. We do. We do. That's why Jesus says, I didn't say that for my sake. I said that for your sake. This voice didn't come because of me. God answered audibly because you needed to hear it. See, we are the ones that need to be pushed. Go! Die! Obey! You're like, well, it could cost me my job. So what? It could cost me my marriage. I don't know if my wife is on board. I don't know if my husband's on board. So what? Well, I don't know if I'm going to get teased at work. Stop it! See, you need to be pushed. We need to be pushed. Jesus never needed to be pushed into living for God's glory. And I'll tell you this, most of us in this room probably haven't made up our minds yet as to whether we're going to live for God's glory. We have the idea that maybe we want to, we're looking into it, but some of us in this room are probably guilty of deciding as we go. And right now, up to this point, things are looking pretty good, so we're okay with it, but we don't know what's coming, do we? We know the verses that remind us we're going to have to sooner or later die to self, but we don't yet know how that's going to look. And if you haven't made up your mind beforehand that when that day comes, you're going to do it no matter what anyway, then you probably won't when that day comes. That's why Jesus has already warned everybody who even thinks about following him to count the cost before they get into it. Think about what you're doing. Think about where Jesus went. Consider whether you're willing to follow in his footsteps. Jesus isn't distracted by the crucifixion part. He's focused on the glory. But he's not ignorant of the crucifixion part either. <laughs> he knows it's coming. He's not ignorant of the part where he dies, but everybody else is. In verse 33, it says that he said what he said to signify the death by which he would die. And then the people answer him and go, well, we've heard from the law that the Christ remains forever. How can you say the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is this guy? Like, we didn't know that dying was part of the equation. What are you... How, what are you talking about, lifted up? They knew he meant crucifixion. Jesus, by saying lifted up, was implying that he would be crucified. They picked up on that and went, wait, what? C -c Crucifixion. We didn't know that was part of the deal. And it's not because they were unfamiliar with all the Old Testament passages that clearly indicated that death and suffering was part of the equation. There's a lot of passages all throughout the Old Testament that should have, or, or so you'd think, made it very clear that, yes, suffering, death, this is what the Messiah has to look forward to. See, these, 
these people, they read the Bible. They knew the Old Testament. They studied it. They memorized it. And yet, they completely overlooked the fact that there was a very practical application to the scriptures that they were reading at the time. Now, do we do that? We know our Bibles. We do our devotions, right? We come to church. We attend classes. We study it. We read it. Some of us memorize it. And then we forget those verses when it comes time to actually suffer and die for our obedience, when we're actually faced with it. See, here they had been memorizing Isaiah, going through it on their scrolls and in every Saturday synagogue meeting, you know, Isaiah 53, he will be cut off and he will be crushed for our transgressions and he'll be... And we went right over their heads. And here now it's staring them in the face. It's time for the Messiah to be cut off and to be wounded for our transgressions and for God to crush him. And they're like, what? What are you talking about? Why, why, why? Listen, if you're the Christ, why would you spring this on us now? I didn't know it was going to be like this. You didn't know it was going to be like this? I thought you read your Bible. And so what does Jesus say in response before he hides himself from them? Okay, because in th verse 36 it says, Jesus spoke these things and then departed and was hidden from them. So what is the last thing that Jesus says? What, what will be ringing in their ears for a while now? In verse 35 he says, A little while longer the light is with you. Walk while you have the chance. Follow the light while it's still shining. For a lot of people, they, the, the window of opportunity opens up and, and like now, God speaks to them most clearly and Jesus goes, you better open that window all the way. In fact, you better go to the front door and throw those suckers open because this is your opportunity. Doors shut and windows close and when that does, it'll be over. You've got the opportunity now if God is speaking to you now and you know what you're supposed to do now and you're hesitant because you think you know already what it will cost and how much it will hurt. Stop thinking about the crucifixion. Focus on the glory that's beyond it. You got one shot. You only get to live one time. And how easily we dismiss this. There will come a day for anybody who dismisses the, the, the significance of what's being said now, there will come a day when you realize how significant it was. If you pass on the opportunity to follow Christ while he's giving you that invitation, this is going to be recollected one day with great regret. Follow me while you have the chance. Don't worry where the path leads. Don't worry about the pain or the discomfort or the death that it might bring. If you follow Jesus only when it's easy, listen to me, guys. <laughs> it's going to have very little effect on the depth of your faith or the influence that you have in this world. Very little effect. Following Jesus when it's easy is easy. <laughs> following Jesus when it's hard, however. Following Jesus when it pushes you beyond your greatest fears to obey him. Following Jesus when it's difficult like that, that will illuminate your soul like a floodlight. Suddenly at that moment, the significance and the reality of true Christianity is going to be more clear than it ever has been and you will be excited because God won't leave you alone when you venture forth with the bravery required to push beyond your fears. God will come through in a way that makes him more real in your life than he is right now. You will get it like you've never gotten it before and you'll only want more. That's why it's dangerous. You go that far once. You may just go far enough to die one day. He says, taste and see, man. Just try it. And you'll see how good this is. Why does he have to encourage us to taste and see? Because it looks unappealing. It's very unappetizing. A life of Christ doesn't look good. He says, but if you taste it, you'll find that it's the best you'll ever have. And you'll only want more. 
running from obedience when it's hard does the opposite. Instead of exciting you and instead of breathing fresh life into your soul and instead of exciting you about the things of God, it actually sinks you further into spiritual despair because you're living a life of disobedience. You're living a life of spiritual lethargy. You don't want to do the things of God and you're dominated by fear. It drains your soul. It quenches the Spirit of God. And over time, it darkens your mind. Some Christians that I've met have been living so long outside of the will of God, they are the most miserable people I've ever met. And even the Bible backs me on that. It says it would have been better had they never known the way of life than to, after having known it, turn from it. So how about you? Is your life right now being marked by frequent defeat in times when suffering and death is needed in order to go further with God? Are you letting fear win? Are you hesitant to lose your life? Are you in danger of dying alone, as Jesus says? Because right now, if that's the case, then that foretells of what your life is going to look like when it culminates. If that's the way life looks for you right now, there is no victory in Christ. There is no enthusiasm. There is no fervor to push and serve and die for Him. Then when your life culminates in judgment, we'll all look back and go, oh yeah, it kind of made sense. There was never any real victory. There was never any real fervor. There was never any real bravery. There was never any real power of God. Either you're living boldly for Christ and losing your life as you go, which will culminate in eternal life, or you're shrinking back in fear and cowardice and you're in danger of losing the life you so cherish. Not to mention the fact, again, that the next generation and generations beyond that are in danger of living without whatever your life was meant to produce. So, you're not an island. you will affect people. No matter what, your life is and will affect people beyond your own generation, whether for good or for bad. Good because all faithful Christians produce fruit that can be enjoyed by others. Bad because your life failed to produce fruit and the next generation is starving because of it. Imagine a world without wheat. A world where maple syrup really has nowhere to go. <laughs> a world where we eat pizza on rice cakes. Imagine a world without spaghetti. A world without any pasta. Oh! Pause. <laughs> Little tear. <laughs> okay, if you appreciate wheat, if you appreciate what wheat has done for you by virtue of its willingness to die, then maybe you can imagine the difference your life could make in future generations if you have the bravery to die for Christ yourself. If you appreciate wheat. And if you can imagine a world without it, if you can imagine what your life would be like without wheat, then maybe you'll think twice the next time you're afraid to obey God because of what it might cost you. Let's pray. Father, we uh, come to you this morning and ask for your Holy Spirit to move in us to uh, keep us walking forward down the path of obedience that you have marked out for us. Uh, please don't allow anybody here to stop short of 
the goal. It is daunting. It is frightful. But there is so much glory beyond the small little tastes of death that we have to experience regularly if we're going to obey you. The fears and the apprehensions and perhaps some mockery or some belittlement or some losing of jobs or whatever. We, we pray that we would be focused not on the suffering, but like Jesus was, on the glory that lies beyond. Because if we only knew, if we could only taste of it, oh, oh, the places we would go. We ask, Lord, that you take us there. If we serve you, if we really serve you, then may we follow you. And wherever you take us, may we go there.